Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead and guide us into all truth, to speak to us. God, and if there is anybody here that has never experienced, they're sensing right now something happening in their heart that the worship melted them and the, and the word is about to prod them. God, may... God, I pray by the power of the blood of Christ that the, the lies of the enemy right now protect each, each and every person who's sensing that. Each person that's in here, God, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. That as the enemy tries to distract them and lie to them and pull them away and, and cause them not to heed the call, today I pray that every single person in this place would heed the call of a living and loving God. May nothing... Nothing interfere with that. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at the first part of chapter 1. Paul explaining what truth was, what faith was, what godliness was, what the hope of eternal life was. We looked at the trouble with big church, the trouble with little church. Now, as sometimes when we go through scripture, there needs to be this explaining. And this word means this, and this word means that, and that means this. The next chapter and a half, no explanation is necessary. I can literally just read it to you and go, okay, thanks, see you later, goodbye. It is that clear. Paul doesn't mince words. He says, this is what I want you to do. Now again, if you're new to our studies, uh, we're looking at the Apostle Paul, who wrote, a, who wrote a letter to a man named Titus. Titus got saved, they say, in Macedonia, which was a city, and, and decided so much so that he loved this message of the cross, this this faith, this new faith that he had in the Lord Jesus, that he said, I want to go with you. I want, to, I want my life to be different. Titus, who at once had no purpose, all of a sudden found purpose. I so relate to that. So busy was I before my days in Christ. So much I had a band and I had my girlfriend and we had a kid. So busy with no purpose. Waking up in the morning and not knowing what I was going to do. Going to bed at night with, with my little black book wondering who I can call before I went to sleep. So distracted in my own thoughts. But Titus, like me, when he got saved, he found purpose. He found something to do when he woke up in the morning. Yes, to set the captives free. To help God, to be the very hands of God. It's an awesome feeling. It's an awesome understanding to know that whether you are unemployed or you're some big shot CEO, that in Christ's kingdom, you both have the same purpose. To share God's love with those that don't have it. No matter how rich, no matter how poor they are. Titus finds his purpose. And he decides he's going to learn and he's going to grow and he's going to follow the Apostle Paul around. And at one point, the Apostle Paul, so trusting in Titus, he says, here, I want you to stay here in Crete. And I want you to start appointing leaders. So many people responding to the message. So different it was back then. So less confusion upon us. The enemy's schemes have not changed one bit. But it seems like he's really stepped up his attack. For back then, they were Jews and they were non-Jews. The Jews were set a law, the commandments, to keep them. And if you did not keep the commandments, it's simple. You couldn't spend eternity with God. And here was this true Jew of Jews... The Apostle Paul, once a Pharisee, which means he was a priest. He comes to the town, and the first thing he would do is go to the synagogues of the Jews and say, I want you to know that the true Lamb of God has come. And the Jews would go, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And he'd take them through the Old Testament and say, here it says he was born in Bethlehem. Here it says he was suffer. Here, And he would go through all the prophecies in the Old Testament. And some of them, the light would go on. And they go, wait a second, do you mean no more sacrifice? No more sacrifice. Now you might not be a true Jew, the vast majority of the Jews in America are what's called Reformed Jews. 
They don't necessarily believe in the very book that they follow partially. Oh, they have family dinners together, like my family, coming from a Jewish background. But to the true Jew, if you sinned, if you stumbled, if you messed up, you'd have to get a lamb out of the flock and you'd bring it to the temple and the priest would come and say, what did you do? And he'd go, oi vey, I sinned bad. I saw some woman who wasn't my wife and oi vey, my eyes. And the priest would say, I understand. And they'd, you'd put your hands on the top of the ram's head and the priest would come and cut its throat. And as the blood would pour out, they'd cut it open, and they'd take the fat, and they'd burn it in one place, and they'd take the meat, and they'd put it in another place. And you knew your sin had cost something. You knew because of the shedding of blood, you were forgiven. And the great thing about your sin, though, is the sacrifice of your sin was not only painful, but it was also helpful to others, for that meat was then given, given to the poor, given to the priests. And to the Jew, he heard that the Lamb of God had come to put away an end to sin sacrifice. No more lambs in the, in the temple? No, no more. The Jew heard that message and they said, tell me more. To the non-Jew, to the Greeks who seek wisdom, they would be in the Aragopolis. They would be, they'd all get together and they'd speak of wisdom. They'd talk of Socrates and Plato. They'd, they'd speak of wisdom. They'd speak of karma. They'd speak of the great scale in the sky. How all your good deeds are put on one side and all your bad deeds are put on the other side. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, yes, you'd get to heaven. Does anybody still believe that? I remember believing that growing up. I remember rescuing like bees out of, I see a, a bee struggling in a puddle. I'd push him out and run away so he didn't sting me. I did a good deed. God will be pleased with me. You robbed your neighbor's house two weeks ago, but that balances it out. <laughs> you guys that are laughing aren't laughing because you think, wow, this guy's a criminal. No, you're laughing because you did the same thing. <laughs> Who cares if I did this? I did, you know, I, I helped an old lady across the street one time with her bags. <laughs> Washes everything away. And Paul would tell them, no such scale, for there is no such thing as moral relativity. What? What's that? Well, there is a right and there is a wrong. Period. There is right and there is wrong. Morality is not relative. If you... I don't even want to go down and get so... You know what I mean. Paul would go and he would preach this message and people they responded man they responded they said really there's forgiveness for my sins for no matter how rich no matter how poor no matter what status what color what forgiveness is the greatest thing in the world if you've never taught your kids me having multiple children, we tell them all the time, say you're sorry. I'm sorry. Say I forgive you. Say I forgive you. I forgive you. <sighs> Sometimes it's not just what you did, it's the being forgiven that's the best. And to know testimony of my life, of violence and the pain that I caused, just to come to church and have somebody say, you're forgiven of your sins. You're like, who are you to grant me forgiveness? And then I hear the story of the one who came and sinned not and shed his blood so that I may be forgiven. Ready? Of everything. 
I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around this, you see. I couldn't get, no, 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 you, but you don't understand where I come from. I'm like from an Italian family, from New York, you know what I mean? We did bad things. Everything. No, 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 but I had a girlfriend once and we went to this place and everything. I just, I remember the wait the first time I went in. It was like, oh my goodness. Freedom, man. I felt like William Wallace in Braveheart. Freedom! When you tell people that, what's their response? Nowadays, depends what college you go to and what family you come from and we don't believe that and we don't believe this and we don't teach that and we don't do this and we don't just came out a list of the top 15 godless cities in in the in the country I was re I read it this morning it's just insane people don't want nothing to do with God they hate God I just I don't get it it's like sometimes I just want to write back what did God do to you <laughs> He just loves you, and he wants to forgive you of their sins. It was that pastor from uh, northern Florida. Where is he from? I don't forget where he's from. Um, Ray Comfort. He says, the reason people don't come to God is because they're afraid of being judged for their sins. The truth of the matter is they don't hate God. They hate themselves. They know what they've done. They look in the mirror, and they see their sin written all over their face, and they just can't believe that they can be forgiven. You must embrace Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the man whose sin is covered. I tell you the same thing that Paul told Titus. He gives you purpose. He gives you freedom. He gives you forgiveness. And you have not earned it. You never can. You never will. You can receive it by just saying, I do. Very much the same way you get married. You say, I do. I do. That's it? That's it. Well, does that mean I have to go to church? Does that mean I have to give my money? Does that mean I have to become a Republican? Does that mean I have to find a church that everybody looks like me? None of that. None of that. You just say, I do. And that's what Titus did. And he grew in the Lord. And in the churches that were in Crete, there a man on a mission, he said, Paul told him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to start appointing elders because so many people said, yes, I need freedom. Yes, I want it. Can you please? Oh my goodness. So the message started to spread like wildfire. Greece was being taken over by Christianity. Beautiful thing. Verse 4, chapter 1, the book of Titus. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint, every, and, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Again, please give you the background because we're going to run through the chapter as we go. There's really no confusion here. Paul tells him, here's what I want you to do. In the places where the message is exploding, in the places where people are coming to the Lord in droves, I want you, as an appointee by me, to go tell these people here in this church, in this home. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't giant churches. These were all home churches. Our church would be considered giant. There was 10 people that met in a house here. There was 10 people that met in a house there. There might have been 20 people that met in a park there. Crete was a little neighborhood, little tiny churches everywhere. Just a bunch of people who heard the message said, I want to know more. Okay. 
For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I command you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. He says, listen, I want you to find the leaders in the church. Now for me, this is twofold. For me, it's not only teaching me what I need to do, but who I need to look for. Do you understand? But for you, it's also the same thing. Maybe you're new in the Lord and you're wondering, when is it time for me to start serving God and not just receiving the word? When is it time for me to look in the mirror or maybe you've been walking with the Lord just a little too long and as I start to read these things, you're like, uh-oh, I'm lacking. And that's a good thing. That's called conviction. That's the Lord knocking on your heart. Please, new believer in Christ, the first thing that you should really aim for, God's not a cop. He's a doctor. He doesn't have eyes of flaming fire to see you and go, ah, you, you're a sinner. I, I saw what you looked at the other day. No, that's not God. That's not God at all. God says, I was with you when you looked at that. And if you need help to stop looking at that, that's what I'm here for. What a great feeling it is to know that God's not a cop, he's a doctor. You know what I mean? What a great feeling it is to know that you didn't come to the Lord, sisters, so somebody could look at your shirt and go, nice shirt. That's how you dress when you go to church. But God's so different, he says, you have a beautiful body and it's for you and the man I've chosen. Wow, what a difference. What a difference in that statement. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know about you ladies, I don't know about you guys, but you ladies, aren't you sick and tired of men oogling at you all the time? Staring at your stuff? I mean, aren't you saying it's like, at what point in time do you cross that line between wanting people to stare at you and sick of people staring at you? Are you all animals? I'll answer that question. Yes, we are. So he says here, I want you to find men that are blameless. Now notice it doesn't say sinless, it says blameless. What's blameless? It means somebody who's constantly confessing their sin to God. For no one is sinless, but as men and women we can be blameless. The enemy cannot blame you. The enemy could look around and go, ha, ah, you, you did this or you did that. And you can say, I confess that to God. I am set free and I am clean. Amen. The enemy's so good. And you know, sometimes, guys, I want you to know that the enemy, he takes the form of your own brain. He crawls inside your head. And when I say you're beautiful, you're wonderful, God loves you, there's this voice in there that goes, yeah, but I know what you did last night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know who you talked to. But I know what you did. That's the enemy. That's your flesh. That's the wicked, foul filthiness that the Bible says that you need to lift up the, the shield of faith that quenches every fiery dart of the wicked one. And when you hear yourself say stuff like that to yourself, you say, self, no, I am set free. I am clean. I am washed in the blood of Christ. I rebuke those thoughts. I don't hear that. Now, what does he forgive us of? Everything. I don't want to go through the list. I've done that too many times. And I said sometimes when I do that, it, it, it really hurts people. Everything. Everything. <laughs> Blameless. The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. So your leaders in the church, your elders. Now notice there's, first, first word used there is, is elders. That word for elders is somebody seasoned and older. You don't appoint a 20, 25 year old as an elder. He said, I want you to look a little bit older. I want you to be a little seasoned, and, and you'll see why as it goes. And I want you to remember that these, their children, should be at least in subjection. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to be believers in Christ Jesus, but they have to be under authority. You with me? Now, again, this is not my rules. I didn't make these rules. This is the Apostle Paul telling 
Titus how to appoint leadership in the church. This is what your lead is. But for you all, you should be able to look at this and go, yes, in my church, that's what it is. Do you know how many churches I know that are growing at such a fast pace that they're appointing people in leadership who should not be in leadership according to Scripture and using poor qualifications? I want you to be looking at this. And I want you to say, hey, pastor, I saw one of your elders. He was out drinking at a club. Now, I don't want you to say that, but I, but I want you to be able to say it. I want you to have the freedom to say it. I want you to keep your church pure. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Well, those sounds like, this sound like great qualities for people, don't you think? I want you to look at the men that we present before you as leaders. I want you to know that they have those qualities and those qualifications. And I want you men that are out there that are not in leadership to aim for them. And to say, yes, that's what I want. And you could ask any one of us leaders who have attained these things. I don't say to you in arrogance, I've attained these things. I say to you in, in, in humble mercy from God that those things I was not, and now I am. By the power of God's love. By the faithful steadiness of every day seeking Him in prayer. I want to ask you another question that might change the game for you a little bit. Ladies, how many of you guys want a man like that? Let me read those qualifications again. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable. A lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Doesn't that sound like a good husband to be married to, single sisters? Married sisters, don't you want your man to be like that? And I'm glad my wife's serving today. <laughs> She'd be like, amen, brother, preach it. <laughs> Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Now, what he's saying is because in the church setting, especially in a small church, you're going to have people that come in there for the wrong reason. And they're going to say, oh, really? The Bible doesn't really say that. Now, unless somebody is knowledgeable in the Word, has their temper under control, has a good heart, you've got to be able to say, eh, da, 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 da. Where, where did you get that from? Where did you read that from? Stop, stop, stop right there. That's false, and I don't want you bringing that into this church. I thought your church welcomed everybody. We welcome everybody who wants to be here, not everybody who's here to destroy everybody else's faith. The Bible talks about there being wolves among sheep. If you're a wolf, we'll find you out and we'll throw you out too, physically if need be. Right, Christian? <laughs> Christian and Matt, that's our security team. <laughs> Isn't it nice to know you can be safe? And I want you to know that I'm reading these things to you so you know. Gentlemen, when you're out of town, your daughters and your wife come here, they're safe. They're not going to get hit on. They're not going to get ogled at. They're safe. I want you to know that, ladies, when you come here, if there's a problem with one of the brothers, you come and you bring it to us, they're safe. We run our church to the best of our ability, as the Bible says. We want you to know that. This is not a meat market. This is not a place to find your next boyfriend, girlfriend, potential spouse. Now, to you that are new to church, you're going, well, like, duh. To you that have been to churches, you're like, thank you, God. Is it, can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful words as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Meaning, you know how many guys have come here and tell me that it's okay for them to have sex with their girlfriends, even though they're not married because, and I go, no, the Bible says that's called fornication. Well, my boyfriend said that. 
Listen to me. What you do is between you and God. And if you're going to do that, you could ask God forgiveness and he'll forgive you. But just know this, you're selling each other's relationship short. So many people, they don't come to God for that reason. I knew it. I knew it. The first thing God's going to do is mess with my sex, mess with my money, mess with my life. That's why I don't go to church. Because every time I go to church, you don't have sex. You've got to give your money. Listen to me. God's laws, the Bible says, are not burdensome. He made you. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what's best for your life. Because in just a few short years, 20-something person, you're going to be 30-something, and you're going to go, you know what? I'm really sick of guys who just want to have sex with me. I wish there was a guy who just wanted to love me. Can we just go out to dinner and hang out? Do, does everything have to end up back at your apartment? <laughs> How did that happen? Listen, because God knows what's best for you. He made you. And some people, they go, see, those Christians, they put up all those rules and laws. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. And here's the illustration my pastor gave, and I love it, and I'll never stop using it. You ever see Tweety Bird and Sylvester? You know how safe Tweety Bird is when he's in his cage? People walk by, oh, the poor bird, he's in a cage. And Tweety's in there like... He says, no, I'm safe. These are my bars. The laws that God gives us, the rules that he gives us, the suggestions that God gives us to live our lives by, they're safety bars from the world. I said this on Wednesday. This is crazy. And I, I just thought about this the other day. I was like, Listen, if, how many of you guys here never, ever want to be a part of an abortion? Ever? Ever? Anybody? Oh, everybody. Yeah. Guess what? Don't have sex. You won't be. Huh? <laughs> don't have sex out of wedlock and if, you, if you're in a marriage same situation you don't want to have babies <laughs> don't have sex although why would you get married if you didn't have sex but totally different subject <laughs> if you don't want to ever ever be a part of an abortion don't have sex doesn't that sound so simple. Hey, guess this. How many of you guys never, ever want to be in drug rehab? Question? Nobody? That's funny. I thought for sure somebody was looking forward to that. <laughs> guess what? Don't ever drink a beer or take a drug. Ever. Don't start with one. Not even one. Don't drink a beer now. You'll never wind up in rehab. But I like a little wine at the, you know, at the end of my day. Listen, you drink all the wine you want. As soon as God knocks on your heart and says, can I have that? Stop. I mean, that's what I did. I like drinking. I was never an alcoholic. I went out with my friends. I probably drank once in a while. I, never, I was never drunk at home. But I go out to the club. I just decided when I got saved. One of the things God did so supernaturally is he knocked in my heart. He said, can I have that? And as a young Christian, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of sick of drinking anyway. And I never drank again. God's so faithful. God's so good. Now listen, young believer, mid-range, two, three, four years old, it's not always that easy. Some things God says, I'm going to leave that with you for a while. And when you get sick of it and you're about to vomit, then I'll help you with it. It's the strangest thing. Some guys I know, they get saved. And like one of the things God did miraculously was my mouth. I had the foulest mouth. New York, Italian family from the... I, could, I was like more creative than most. <laughs> you can combine words, you know what I mean? I could, one sentence, I could say more, sent, more curses in that sentence than there were words in the sentence. <laughs> Overnight, the conviction of God fell upon me. But for you guys that have been walking with the Lord and you're still cursing, don't feel, don't, don't feel bad about that. You know how many times I'm around guys and they, they'll say a four-letter word, oh, sorry, Pastor. And it's like, to me, you're sorry? <laughs> if you feel that bad, don't do it no more. But don't feel bad for me. I, I've heard them before. Believe me, I've heard all of them. <laughs> My mother probably told me them. <laughs> God will take it from you. Don't worry about it. God will take it. He'll knock on you. When he says, come on, come on, come on, give me that. Just give it to him. 
Remember, he's not a cop. He does, did you, did you just say that word? That's it. I'm getting you fired from your job. Do you know how many people believe that? God's mad at me now. Why? Because I said, you know what, the other night. Do you know how many people think God punishes them? It's insane the way we live, forgetting He's our holy and heavenly Father. His love for us is never ending, it's unabounding, it doesn't have. It's, could you imagine treating your child like that? Your kid stumbles. My son, three, four years old, wanted to run around everywhere. You've heard this story. My son had a hobby at three. It was throw as many phones in the toilet and the bathtub as he can. <laughs> at no point in time did I ever duct tape his hands and his feet. You're never doing any. I never picked him up and put him against the wall. What's the matter with you? He was three years old. We laughed. <laughs> he did it again. I was like, I know. He's costing me a fortune. I started buying my my stuff from Best Buy and getting the, getting the uh, warranty. It's like 16 phones in two years. That's too much. <laughs> what was the thing? I don't get it. We found one in the washing machine one time. <laughs> he doesn't do that anymore. He's 15. He had to outgrow it. Wow, did that sound good. Yeah, but sometimes it's just time to outgrow it. Verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Basically, he's saying a lot of the Jews, they're coming to the, they're coming to the Lord and they're holding fast their old traditions. For us, like for me, I, I grew up Catholic. You've got to let go of those old traditions. You've got to let them go. They don't apply anymore. We follow the Bible. You don't have to do the whole genuflect thing. You don't have to get the cookie before you leave. You don't have to do that anymore. But, but what if I take a little bit of this, like I had heard if, you know, in my house, you keep a dashboard saint, you know, one of those saints, and you get a little less red light and less tickets. That's superstition. Don't do that to God. He loves you. But I keep getting tickets. Then slow down, idiot. <laughs> Well, why doesn't God make the cop blind when I drive by? <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you know how many times I, I hear stuff like that? Well, God knew I was going to, then what? <laughs> why did you rob the store then, buddy? You don't want to go to jail. That's another one we can do. How many of you guys never want to go to jail? <laughs> don't rob nobody. It's simple. Don't start now. You won't have to worry about it later. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things that they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. It kind of flies in the face of the whole nicey-nice movement. <laughs> the whole Joel Osteen, everybody's happy movement. Hey, sometimes God gets in your face. And sometimes God's people look in your face. Hey, dude, your kids are out of control, bro. Do you need some help with them? Hey, sister, you know, <laughs> honey, tell that girl to put some clothes on. She's driving the brothers crazy. I can't believe they said that. Why? They love you. I read this morning in my morning devotion, the Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend. That better is an open rebuke than love carefully concealed. Somebody sits a farm and says, man, I love that dude. I love that dude. Why don't you tell him his tag's expired? Oh, no, man, I don't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> but if you tell him his tag's expired, even if it hurts his feelings, then he probably won't get pulled over and get a ticket. No, man, I'm just going to love him from afar. <laughs> Real love gets in your face, you know? I mean, I know my married brothers in here could... <laughs> your wife, I'm sure you believe most, half of the time she loves you. <laughs> and she's always telling you what to do, is she not? I mean, I know my wife is, bless her heart. Honey, you shouldn't do that. Honey, you shouldn't say that. Honey, you shouldn't wear that. Honey, you should... 
<laughs> she ain't doing it because she hates me. She's doing it. She loves me. And she feels safe. And I feel safe. And I go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had no idea how screwed up I was until I got married. <laughs> You feel me, Mark? For, verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. And then I love this last uh, verse he has in verse 1 in the chapter 1. He says, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. To the pure all things are pure. You ever see those people? They can make a sexual comment about everything you say. It's like, that's what I loved about The Office. They took that to a new level. If they said that's what she said about everything. You guys are Office fans. That's what she said. That's what she said. It's like, wow. You hang out with some people and it's like, everything you say is something perverse. It's like, man, I thought I was wicked in my non-Christian. People are, are even more now. To the pure, though, all things are pure. And that's where we want to rejuvenate, re renew, wash ourselves down. Your kid says something that in the old days you'd make a comment on. Somebody says something. I love that. My wife is so like that. My wife says things all the time. That I look at her and I go, you have no idea what you just said, do you? <laughs> it's the funniest thing that happened. I have a 25-year-old daughter. When she was 23, there was an interview on TV of a woman who said, a word that you ought not ever say to a woman. I'm not going to tell you which word it is. I'm not even going to. It's that bad. And she looked at me and she said the word and she said, what is that? <laughs> I went, where did you hear that? This woman just said that on TV and there was a whole big uproar. And I was like, I love you, baby. <laughs> she had no idea what the word. She never heard it. To the pure, all things are pure. But again, she, he says, to the undefiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Let me explain to you what he says here. You have the right in your church to expect more from your pastors, from your elders. and from, You have that right. If you go outside and my truck has a pair of balls hanging at the back of it, you got to say, dude, are you serious? How old are you? You have the right to expect that. At some point in time, you grow up and you just go, you know, you look and you go, man, wait a second, I'm 35 years old and I have two bull balls hanging from my truck. I do something about this right now. You know what I mean? Geld your truck, man. <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> Believer, to the pure all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and their conscience. Boy, I'm glad my wife's not in here. I'm going to be in so much trouble later. So much. Continuing, but as for you, verse 1, chapter 2, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now he turns his, his attention to Titus and he says, listen, here's what I want from you. I want you to speak things that are sound doctrine. Doctrine is teaching, teaching what is right. I want you to teach what is right. I want you to speak the things that your older men are sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith and love and patience. Listen to me. That word for sober is the only one I need to interpret. That doesn't mean not drunk. That word for sober means... To, to purposely temper your own freedom. Purposely temper your own freedom. That's to be sober. To go, you know what? I can go out and do anything I want because pastor said that Jesus will love me no matter what. But I'm not gonna because it will displease God. It will wreck my house again. A little emotion I'm going to throw at you. Stay with me because we're going we're gonna to finish right after this. I remember doing stupid things and going back to my house and driving back to my house and on the way back to my house going, I can't believe I did this again. I hate the fact that I can't stop doing this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Because I could not temper my own freedom. And yo, yes, the Lord loved me. 
and so disappointed with a heart of love he still was at me. I just, at one point, I was like, I gotta be more sober in my life. I gotta stop this ridiculousness. Does anybody, am I alone in this? I, just to look at, to see that look in my girlfriend's face, who is now my wife, again to tell her, I lost another job. I messed up again, honey. I just, I needed something better. The older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. You know what? I'm going to go back because I don't have enough time to finish this whole chapter. We're, we're going we're to end there. Uh, we're going to do um, communion. And, and then next week we'll go through all chapter. I want to go through chapter two, but I, I didn't know the Lord would lead me to, to do the whole thing. Did, guys, come on up. We're going to hand out communion. Now, again, if you're new to church and you're saying you come from a Catholic background, let me explain to you that the Lord Jesus on the last day before he was crucified, he got his apostles together and he had bread and he broke it and he had wine and he poured it and he said, I want you to do this symbolically. I want you to do this often. Now, you can do communion at home. It wouldn't be wrong to do communion at home, you and your wife and kids, but it's the attitude of the mind here that's important. Now, if in the things that I said to you today, there was something that spoke to your heart. That's the calling of God. That's the conviction. You guys could hand it out. I want you to know that my words are not convicting. My attitude toward life is not infectious. But when I'm speaking the word of God and it's going forth in a setting where the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to move upon you, you will find something happening in your heart. And that's what's happened to you all today. So I want you to make a decision before you take me. Now you can take all, everybody take the elements, but I want you to understand that what you're looking at, I'll take these. Oh, thank you. What you're looking at here is a symbol. Now watch, you're from outside, you're, you're not from, from, from a church setting, you're going, what do you got? I got a piece of matzah and a, and a half a, there's a cute little cup where you get them cups. They sell these cups. And somebody from the outside world, they're looking and they go, what are you doing? I got the cookie and I got the cup. Here's a little cup and here's a little, cup. listen to me. This is a solemn time. What we are doing is reminding ourselves what we're living for. This is the perfect opportunity for the Christian that's been away from God to say, that's right. That's right. I'm a Christian. To receive a fresh dose of forgiveness, a fresh inpouring of love. But for you that's not a Christian, this might be your opportunity. This might be your opportunity to say yes. Yes to Christ. Yes. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. Freedom. That freedom that that guy was talking about. That's what I want. That sober-mindedness that's escaped me for so long. That's what I need. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of living my life for me. The Lord Jesus said it is better to give than receive. And he didn't just mean money. He meant of yourself. It's good for the soul to give to others. As they play, I want you to look at what this represents, what the Lord Jesus himself said. This represents his broken body. Look at this piece of matzah. It, has, it is unleavened bread. It has no sin in it. That was our Lord. It's burnt because on the night he was betrayed, his friends burnt him. They all left him in his hour of need. It's got holes in it because he was nailed to a cross for you and for me. And it's our chance to show God, either to renew or for the first time to say, yes, yes. And you take when you do. We'll do it together. Don't do it. Just look at it. I want you to look at it. And then I also want you to look at the cup. It's the representation of his blood. 
And that, at first that sounds more, but that sounds horrible. You tell me I'm going to make believe I'm going to drink somebody's blood? Yes. And this is the same thing that caused thousands to flee. The Lord Jesus, he said this. Am I yelling? I feel like I'm yelling. I'm sorry. Oh, I did that. The Lord Jesus, he said, um, if you don't drink my blood and eat my body, you have no part with me. And his, his, his followers, not his apostles, but his followers, not those that were serious about having a relationship, but those who are serious about getting something for nothing. They said, this is a hard saying, who can know it? And he said to them, does this offend you? Does this offend you that I tell you to eat my body and drink my blood? He says, don't you understand that I'm speaking spiritually, symbolically? You don't understand these things? Don't you have even the smallest amount of understanding of spiritual things? That what the world deems is ridiculous and silly, this is not for me, this is for you. This will renew your heart, will renew your mind, it will remind you of the first love. In the book of Revelation he says, return to your first love. Do you remember when the fire was hot? Do you remember first getting saved? Do you remember first meeting your wife or your husband and just being absolutely stunned? I remember the first time I saw my wife, I was abs. I'm telling you, in Italian we used to have a word for thunderbolt. She struck me, I could not believe how beautiful this woman was so madly in love from the second I saw her. I want that feeling toward God. I want it again. I want to be so crazy in love with God because I know He's got the best for me. I believe that. So think about the things that I just said. Looking at that and looking at this, I'll come back after they play a little bit and, and I'll make up and we'll take together as family.
start or start anew in your relationship with the Lord of your life, the lover of your soul, your eternal Father. Show him and show yourself. Take his body. of intentions without the power of God can do nothing for you. That's dry bread, isn't it? Is that disrespectful? No. Okay. This is the power of God. This is the symbol of His power. His blood that set you free. The, the, the Bible says that this is the cup of the new covenant. Remember how we talked about the, the sin sacrifice? You're saying now, you understand, there's nothing you can do for forgiveness. Doesn't matter how many good deeds, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're accepting the forgiveness of God based upon what He did. You see, He paid a debt that you owed because you couldn't pay it. You've been set free. He went before the judge and he said, paid. Are you ready for that? Partake. What a great way to start your day. What a great way to start your week by renewing, your, professing your faith and saying to God, let's, let's start over. Let's start over. Let's start over. What a, what an awesome, awesome blessing. Will you finish the rest of that song? Because I love that song. And guys, have a great rest of your week. And God bless you all. Praise God.